All right. Today I have my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Afruz Demery. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. I am really excited for our conversation. We were just we were just going on a little geeky magic carpet ride in the pre-chat, um, talking about all the things we we're gonna talk about today. And I was like, okay, we have to stop talking right now. We have to like save it for the save it for the podcast. And I am I want to talk today about fertility and your, the way that you view fertility and then of course infertility. And I'll share with you that when I was thinking about becoming, when I started wanting children, that's when I really started, you know, personally paying attention to my nutrition and how I was moving and the, you know, the health and integrity of my hips. And professionally, I also started getting interested in how I could care for my pregnant patients in when I had my brick and mortar practice. So I was saying to you in the pre-chat, I was uh, all I wanted to know about round ligament tension and intrauterine constraint and making sure that the sacrum, you know, didn't get in the way of labor and like how we can help our moms postpartum when their frame is kind of coming back together. And that was the pr- my primary focus was like when once the woman got pregnant how we can support her changing frame. And of course, there was nutritional um, uh, considerations in there as well, which I want to talk to you about today, like folate and omega-3s and all this kind of stuff. But you, I love your work because you look at fertility from not just once the person is pregnant. It, this is a, a mindset shift almost where you want to be talking about this from preconception before the couple are thinking about having children. Can you uh, explain how you sort of came to that view and maybe what even attracted you to working in the, in the world of, of fertility? Yeah, honestly, I never wanted to get in this field. I always thought it was a, it's a hard field to, to deal with people who are infertile. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of intensity. And so this was not something I chose. I kind of blame it on my daughter. Um, but there's two reasons I came to really specialize in this field. I had had a very early miscarriage. I was 27, 28, very young, and I didn't think anything of it. Before then, I had had ovarian cysts, a fibroid. They told me the cysts could be bad, and they removed my whole ovary accidentally. And so I was terrified because I had only one ovary left. And I wasn't even thinking of having a baby at that time. But long story short, I ended up having a daughter and she had a lot of health issues. And after her seventh surgery at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, I started thinking, gosh, like when I thought of having a child, I went to the OBGYN. Basically, they had taken me off birth control pill years before. And really, I didn't do much. Like I didn't really eat differently. I didn't do anything. I just got pregnant. And then things start. Then you start taking folic acid and your prenatal and then cut out coffee and wasn't really a big drinker anyways, but then no alcohol. And it was, it was, that was it. That was it. First of all, no one looked at my husband like nada. And so I started looking and finding out research for what she had, the disease that she had, and I found so much research on these genetic SNPs and how I shouldn't have been taking folic acid because of what she had, and that's how it all started. So Naya really drew me into that field because I had to have questions answered that no one could answer, and I was terrified to have another kid. I always wanted to have like 10 kids. But after her, I was like, I'm done. Like This was so heartbreaking and so difficult that I, I was had to do the digging for myself. That's one. The second part was I was specializing in women's health, as many of us do, and then seeing that, okay, well, a lot of the issues that they have or their kids have goes back to like childhood issues, mentally, emotionally, how they ate, how many times they had antibiotics, all that stuff. And then it goes back to pregnancy. What did mom do during pregnancy? How did she feel during pregnancy? What was her microbiome like? You know, what was her diet like? And then I started thinking, well, the root cause of disease actually starts even before then. When that egg and that sperm meet, epigenetically, those genes are, are, are set, but the rest of that has to do with the quality of that egg and the sperm. And no one talks about that. That's not even a thing. So it was actually in the hospital when, when we thought we had lost her in one of the surgeries with the anesthesia issues that I coined the term trimester zero 
because to me that was the root cause of everything everything starts when everything starts right mm -hmm. but no one looks at that there's no doctor that you go see to say hey i'd like to prepare for pregnancy whether it's in three months a year three years what should i be doing often if you look it's like don't do drugs don't like make sure you don't have crazy STDs, which we would, it's all common sense stuff, you know, like you can still drink two cups of coffee, you can have like four cups of alcohol, uh, four glasses of alcohol, and like such, get your HIV and chlamydia and gonorrhea tested and that's it. Right. So it's like such really, a low bar. It's like, here's the, here's like such a low bar that you need to meet in order to, yeah. you know, become pregnant or have a, have a healthy pregnancy. Yeah. And so I think those two reasons, uh, this is how I got into this. And then the more and more I got into this, I was like, like there was a resistance part that I'm like, really, Afros, is this really what you want to do? And I, it's such a calling. It's such a gift because A, I've been through so much of it myself, the miscarriage, the fibroids, the cysts, the symptoms. We were talking about over testing just pri pri previously. And looking back now, I say my body was telling me something was off, you know, all mm. those years of drinking coffee, staying up late in naturopathic medical school, you were into chiropractic school, you know, it wasn't very healthy. I mean, we were the know. most unhealthy health practitioners. It was such a, um, it was such an ironic, I was like, I am yes. studying to become a health provider and educator and I am 20 pounds overweight, depressed, and I, I hate my life right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, looking back, my body was saying like, please stop, please slow please down, stop. or please give me things. I mm -hmm. had even cervical dysplasia, which was picked up. I had a heart flutter. All the naturopathic doctors during training actually were the ones who picked these up and my regular mm -hmm. doctor hadn't, but I, I still wasn't at that place. Even though I grew up in a very Persian herbalist family, you know, we were very in tune with food as medicine. I wasn't, I wasn't in tune. I was like that type A ambitious, go, go, go. I got this, I can do more. What else can I do? And so I had three clinics, I had 20 employees. I remember I was just go, go, go. And then we got a home, we renovated it. And I remember cleaning out black mold from my bathroom, not even putting the two and two together that this probably isn't good to inhale. You know, I had bleach because I had read up on how to clean it up. And later on, you know, I became Dr. Shoemaker, you know, I learned a lot about mold and fertility. I learned about how much we breathe these toxins in and we pass it on. And then just the stats, I mean, I'll just throw some things at you. Like back 20 years ago, compared to now, what we find in the first poop of that baby, the meconium, the amount of mercury, the amount of BPAs, the amount of half the things we can't even pronounce. Nowadays. DDT, I know DDT has been found, which has been outlawed um, since the seventies. You find absolutely. that too, lead. It's, yeah. it's so high that it's, we are really harming our future generation and our grandkids. Because for me, when you have a daughter, you're also carrying your granddaughter, as you know. So we, we need to be more responsible, you know, and all, usually couples aren't. I, all I cared about is what is he or she going to look like? Mm -hmm. uh, what is she going to be like? You know, I, I feel bad. What's the nursery going to look like? That's the other thing. It's like, it's like, is it going to be this organic, you know, thing? Is it going to be white and owl theme? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I wasn't really thinking, what am I passing on? What about all those feelings in my mouth? You know, what about all these things? And so it's not out of fear. Like when I see a patient, we're not trying to over test and say, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have that? Have you thought of miscarriage, miscarriage prevention? No, like that is the worst thing you could do because now you're actually giving that power. But really what you want to do is, are you fertile? Which to me is, are you as healthy as you can be for your age at this time? What does that mean? It doesn't mean you need any tests actually. You look at your cycle. I love the cycle. The cycle is like your report card, right? For how you've been doing the last few months. And so do you have pain? I had painful cycles. Do you have irregular cycles? Do you feel so moody before them? Do you get headaches before them? Are they clotty? Are they heavy? I mean, I, the list goes on and on. What color is it? And so all these basic things tell you hormonally, are you imbalanced? Are you a cold person? Do you stand up and you get all lightheaded? How are your adrenals? Are you a cortisol junkie and like love things that stimulate you and wire you out and you don't want to sleep, you know? So you, you take a good history as you know, and you can tell when someone is in a good state when their body is 
balanced. And my biggest passion now is male fertility. So we know that male fertility is like just declining year after year. And what used to be considered normal back then, we found that men weren't fitting in the normal range. So we just keep lowering the normal range for count, for morphology, for I mean, if you look at the heads and the tails now, like over 70% of, of a male's uh, sperm being bad is considered normal. So like, when did that happen? How is that possible? Well, we have to, otherwise we'd have to tell everyone they're abnormal. Right. So, right. And this is the, this is the thing I love about functional medicine is when we look at labs and just to expand on the point you just made, when we look at labs from two, a, you know, decade ago, two decades ago, three, the, those labs, like what was normative was a much tighter range, but what we've done and what labs often do is they're just representative of the population in the area. So you just start expanding what normal means so that you can, and normal now just means common. And this is why I'm such a word nerd because normal and common are not the same. You know, having uh, menstrual pain, as you were saying, if you have, if you're very moody or you have lots of clots and it's very, you know, you have clots that are larger than the size of a quarter, or, you know, you are, you have spotting up until your, up until your actual menses, those things might be common, but sorry, they're not, that's not normal. And what I think, uh, and this is where I, uh, like I said, I have a, a huge appreciation for functional uh, medicine here is because what we do is we say, no, actually this wide range of what is considered what we call common is not normal. This is actually the tighter range that it should look like. And this is how we can, um, and this is how we can move to fix it. And I, and I'm with you, like we were talking uh, in the pre-chat around over like so much testing and I was saying to you, like I have, a, I have this new uh, client that I'm working with and the, the, the pages and pages of tests that I am now, uh, you know, looking over and kind of amalgamating with like the program I'm designing for her. It's like, why don't we just first talk about some foundational basics that apply to every human, yeah. irrespective of sex? You know, let's talk about food. Let's talk about movement. Let's talk about stress reduction and sunshine and water. Let's just start with like, can you drink more water every day? Like, let's start there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I always say everything a baby needs. You know, we got to have those foundations first touch, safety, water, good sleep, yeah. good food, safety. Mm. You know, so yeah. all these human basic needs. And it's not all just physical and supplements and what do I eat? It's mm -hmm. love. It's being touched. It's feeling loved and acknowledged and that you're aligned, like, you know, and, and yeah, safety, security, which interestingly in Ayurvedic medicine is a lot of that root chakra. And I see a lot of women. I had two women this morning, actually, um, with pregnancy loss at 23 weeks or the cervix can't hold, right? Mm -hmm. Or they're mm -hmm. low in progesterone and things are dropping. They're prolapsing. And so it's it's very interesting when you do this work and you hear the stories behind that body and then you hear the next person with the same physical symptom but the same similar story and so this is what i love about what i do is because i don't have to follow guidelines and my friends who are OBGYNs, and we talk about this and some of them are so open-minded they're often asking me like what is this about like i keep getting patients with this you know, I do the PubMed search and I can't find anything. I don't know what to do for them. Mm -hmm. And this is the beauty of mind-body medicine. Sometimes there is an emotional component. Um, how we perceive stress and what stress means to us is important. But often my patients will say, my fertility doctor said, stress has nothing to do with fertility. It hasn't been proven yet. Or the MTH. Oh, that's my favorite. That's my favorite word. Proven. Yeah. yeah. Proven. You know, okay. Mm -hmm. I was actually just in a docu series called Proven. And mm. and to be honest, you and I, I think we, we love science. We are definitely we love to geek out and we read articles and I'm all for it. But it's kind of like, well, we used to think the the earth was was flat and right. We and we used to think cigarettes were there was no there was no problem with cigarettes either. You know, exactly. two out of three doctors recommend Camel or whatever it was. Exactly. And so yeah. often I it just like. Oh, I try not to like mm. get, get my ego involved, but it's, it's shameful. It's like, sometimes I feel like it's murderous. The things we tell our patients, the blame we put on them, the things we tell them to do so quickly 
they can't conceive and it's like IVF. Like, oh, you've been trying for six months to a year. Here we go. And then it's like, wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. No one even like asked the right questions because they just weren't trained to ask those questions. Or I have, how many patients do I have who have been on birth control pill? I can't even tell you who've told me. I have what we write in, in um, naturopathic medicine. We put NWS. And we always highlight this. This means never well since. Mm -hmm. If you look at my charts, you'll always see an NWS. And I can't tell you how many times there's an NWS from birth control pill. Meaning yeah. this person's telling me that not only did they have side effects, but they haven't been themselves since. Why? Because probably the microbiome change, the gut microbes that affect their brain, their mood are different, their hormones, their nutrients the way they even choose their partner, their smell changes, you know? So, I, I mean, I became fascinated because I was on the birth control pill when I attracted my partner. And when I read that research, I was like always, not to go back and no regrets, but I was always curious, like, wow, it actually changes your pheromones. And like, that's how you attract your mate. Like mm -hmm. we're messing with the body. And we think for our whole life, we're so anti-pregnancy, like, you know, I was terrified, like, don't go and get pregnant, don't get pregnant. And then all of a sudden, we just assume that mentally and physically, when we're ready, that the body and the mind are going to be like, oh, okay, let's go. Yeah, she's I ready now. It. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah. Just all of a sudden, yeah. for like 25 years or 20 years or 15 yeah. years, it's been no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. And then now we're open. So it doesn't work like that. So many women don't get their cycles. And that's not what they're told. The, every day I hear this. No, my OBGYN said there's no science that the birth control pill has any effect. It may delay the onset of you getting your period for like two or three months. I'm like, hell no, that is not what I see. Yeah. Like I have pages and pages and pages of patients and, and this is evidence, you know, and, and we're kind of looked down upon sometimes as we're not practicing evidence-based. It's not science-based, but I'm like, where is the research? Come do it. Come do it on my patients. I'll, I'll show it to you. And you so, do have evidence. You have, cl do. you have clinical I'm evidence. You know, there's, there's different types of, and I, I, rally, I probably mentioned this yeah. once an episode. So it's, you know, the listeners are probably like, okay, here she goes oh, again go. about information and application. Did. But like, there's a difference between information that you find in the medical literature and the clinical application of that. There is there is clinical evidence and there is information where we control in a lab and everything is controlled for. And I, I'm with you on the birth control pill. I mean, we did, we've talked about the birth control pill quite a bit on this podcast, Jolene Brighton. We did a two part series with her. I have talked about it. There's an AMA. I can't recall which one I did. It might've been number two or I can't remember which one it was now. I'll put it in the show notes, but if you don't allow a woman to initiate and experience her own menstruation, by default, the eggs that she's going to be able to produce are not going to be of the best quality. We know that the birth control pill affects not only the, our microbiome in our gut, but it, it affects our vaginal microbiome. It affects our pelvic microbiome. And it, you know, even when you think of a woman who is, you know, is, is pregnant, it's her first baby or second or whatever, maybe, and she's thinking of having a vaginal birth. Well, that traditional type of birth, which, confer, which is supposed to confer all these benefits of the baby passing through the birth canal. And as the baby's passing through, they'll be exposed to the vaginal microbiome, thereby initiating their own immune system. I mean, then it's sort of, it's negated, right? It's sort of, it's for not if her own, if she, if her own microbiome, where, whether it's her vaginal, pelvic, you know, uh, gut microbiome has been altered by years and years of being on the birth control pill. Like, you know, it's sort of like, yeah. why are we having vaginal births then? If there's, you know, there's no benefit then. It's not even that to me, psychologically, it goes even deeper to control oppression, suppression. It's like the authority figures, even our doc, even doctors, like we yeah. have this power over our patient. To yeah. me, the birth control pill, it's the same thing. It's like, Oh, I have acne. Oh, I have painful cycles. Oh, I have endometriosis or I have PCOS. Oh, we got this. We are just going to shut the system down and tell you what to do. There is, there's something wrong there that I didn't even think about before when I was on it, that 
I am taking my own power away. I, as a female, with all this wisdom of years of grandmas and grandmas who, who knew what to do when something was wrong, who used to go give birth on their own with other women, mm -hmm. now I'm like this masculine energy of control saying, you, you can't do this. You, you are doing this wrong. I'm going to shut down your whole hormonal system for God knows how many years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, and I will give you the right dose of hormones, synthetic hormones, whether it's a NuvaRing, IUD, it doesn't matter, birth control. So it, it goes even beyond that. And the issue I see now is they weren't told all this. So as you know, yeah. it's the consent. And they had PCOS. And now I'm like, they're off it. Now they're like, okay, in a year I want to get ready. And I'm like, you don't even, we, we got so much fixing to do. Your brain isn't talking to your ovaries right now. Like we got we to gotta just get those two organs and talking to each it. other like, how yeah can you tell? it's kind of like silencing a kid who's sad and just like putting a band-aid on it and saying okay i got this now you can't cry like now yeah. you're not going to cry and, and since we can't hear the sound. baby crying anymore there must not be a problem right? and then after 10 years you take it off and that child is not talking and then you go come on like what do i need to take what do i need to do uh, let's do ivf let's like pump it with drugs to get it to talk and it's like mm. oh it's so heartbreaking that we are doing this to ourselves. We're not yeah. gentle with ourselves. We're not yeah. listening, you know? Yeah. And so that's my role. And I bring women together and you hear everyone else's story. And it's so easy to see it in someone else and kind of go, well, you're kind of depressed. You're anxious. You're saying you're overweight. Like could the birth, could your hormonal system be some of those be a side effect from that? And I love when Harvard finally came out and said the side effects, you know, because in Chinese medicine, I learned this in school, which is why I came off it. The, the side effects, right? But again, this is something I would bring up with my OB and she'd be like, no, 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 there's, that's not true. Even mm -hmm. Accutane, like I've had patients who've done one round of Accutane and their pituitary gland is done, no period after that. I mean, it's rare, but it's in PubMed. You do the search, you'll find it. Right. So often the science is even there but they're not communicated or it, you know, what do they say? It takes 17 years for research actually to make it into medical school or into some, someone's ear where they actually learn it. But mm -hmm. I would love double blind placebo control tries, but who's going to do that? Who's going to take two groups of women, 10 years of birth control pill, no birth control pill, and then follow them all throughout their life and measure how their kids are doing. Right. So often what we, what people don't know is they're measuring live birth. And it kind of stops there. Do you know how many kids in the U.S. die in their first year after birth? It's astonishing. There's this huge debate going on right now, whether it's the vaccines at birth that we give, like the Hep B, the K, the, the pregnancy, the flu shot. Who knows? We really don't know. But it's crazy how many kids I have lost with my patients who... We wouldn't have known, you know, and now I'm thinking, wow, this is like insane. Why are so many kids dying of sepsis? I had a patient this morning who had twins at 25 days. Her Both her kid, kids get sepsis from E. coli. Later on, they found out that she had E. coli. So to me, it's all immune system microbiome, which is why in my program, the number one system I work on with every single couple is their gut. Not because we say everything starts in the gut, but because we are seeing autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's, every disease you can think right. of as that right. kid grows and becomes mm -hmm. an adult is linked back to the immune system and the gut. Forget COVID and everything going on right now. So that microbiome, those bugs, the diversity. So often I just say like eat colorful vegetables, eat things you don't normally eat, you know, and, and don't be scared. Don't have the same breakfast every day. Don't have the same lunch every day. Just diversify. And you can't fix these with probiotics. You know, I'm actually not one of those people that recommends a ton of probiotics to my patients. I prefer fermented foods. Same. I love fermented foods. foods. Sauerkraut is, I just, I love sauerkraut so much. Yeah. Just yeah, even just the juice. Like if you just have some of the juice, it's like yeah. <laughs> way yeah. better than any probiotic. You get it right. Yeah, because a lot of my patients will say, well, I'm on the birth control, but I'm taking probiotics or I went on antibiotics, but I'm taking my probiotics. So I'm good. And it's like, no, nah, we still even clinically don't know. Like, mm -hmm. do those bugs stay there? They only yeah. stay there if you feed them. So focus on the prebiotics, which is just a fancy word for vegetables and fiber, you know. So I think knowledge and experience speaks so much more than reading a PubMed article and knowing what do I do with that, you know. So 
that's what I love about what we do is because we have that, that knowledge, but we also have the wisdom and other tools and clinical experience. And we hear stories. We get to spend hours with patients and really dig deep and go, oh, wow, I didn't even think of that. So our patients have taught us so much that we could have never learned in just medical school textbooks and articles. That's correct. And I, one of the things you said was, um, I just wanted to circle back to it. And then I want to ask you about, um, I want to actually parse, I want to tease apart male and female fertility, but it, it's in terms of things like the pill and yeah. other medications, um, and it doesn't have to be the horm- it doesn't have to be the actual pill. Any sort of hormonal contraception, we really do attach ourselves to the promise of what it's going to give us, and we divorce ourselves from the risks. And like you were saying, it's like your sense of smell changes, your libido. I mean, which is sort of funny, right? Like you yeah. you don't want <laughs> you are actually less you have less desire around sex when you're on the pill because it changes your levels of testosterone. It changes your microbiome as we've been discussing. And the, one of the things I, I, I always want to highlight for anyone who's listening, if you are a mother and you're having these conversations with your teenager about whether or not you should be going on the pill or not, the, the one thing I have always found just to your point around this, we have this arrogance that as doctors that we can sort of take this one little thing and manage it. Oh, we're just going to take your menstrual cycle and we're just going to medically manage that. And it's just, it's not going to have any other effect on any other part of your body or your system. And it's, and we do that all the time, right? We do that all the time. We do that with the birth control pill. We do that with any like, you know, any new shiny blinky medication that comes out. We're like, look at what this is going to do. And we attach ourselves to the promise of it and not actually look at what some of the, the downstream effects uh, might be, however uncomfortable that makes us, right? Yeah. So um, I just wanted to highlight what you said there because I, I, I love the idea and this is why I wanted to have this conversation with you. You and I get along very well. Like you and I have very similar philosophies in terms of healthcare in that it is really important to educate our patients so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. Maybe after telling someone all of the symptoms around and potential complications based on your clinical experience that they might say, you know what? I still want to go on the pill. I still want to manage my acne. Nothing else seems to be working. And that's yeah. fine, but that you do it from a place of informed consent. I hate it when I have a patient that's like, you know what? I've been on the pill for 30 years. No one ever told this to me. I've never actually had my own period. Why can't I get pregnant? And then you are the one that's tasked as a doctor to, you know, first of all, to have this, you know, maybe this is just me, but I have this like rage because I'm like, why did no one t- tell you this? It's unbelievable that no one has said this to you. But then there's this woman's life and her, you know, her lineage, right? Like her mitochondria, if anything, that is her lineage that she passes on to her children. So we want to be at least. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, I don't know if that day will ever come, unfortunately, where we, because if imagine every OBGYN gave all those warnings, like I can't imagine many people going, oh, sign me up. You know, yeah, because, I'll take it. Yeah, then what, <laughs> what other yeah. tool do they have, you know, or right. if a psychiatrist, a patient's not able to focus, like other than Adderall, you know, like, so I have, I have all these patients, couples, men who are on antidepressants. I had a man they're, they're 37 weeks pregnant now and they've had two miscarriages. And I was like, looking at the guy, I'm like, I know no one's told you this, but you got to come off your meds. I'm going to help you come off your yeah. Adderall, yeah. your, you know, Prozac and your sleep medication, the weed that you're smoking, all this stuff. No one's dealt with your anxiety. Like, it's almost like seeing the person now as a person. Mm. And like, I always say so many people listening probably don't want to have kids. This isn't about having kids. This is you being, like I said, the, in the best place you can be, but those drugs have an effect on your health. And Oh, like my pet peeve is when I have pregnant females on all these drugs and they're told they're safe. Mm -hmm. What is safe? Does safe mean that my child is not going to be formed, like have deformities or does it mean that this is actually good for my child? That's how I want you guys to think about it is, is this nutriently feeding the soul of this child and physically cellularly helping my child? Is this Mm -hmm. something I would give my child right now? If it, if he or she was in front of me, would you give this medication to them? Would you give your acne cream that you put on your face with steroids? Would you rub that on your child? Would you 
yeah. with the makeup that you use on your face and the things that you use in the perfume, would you spray that on your kid? See it that way. Even if yeah. you don't ever want to have a child, right? right? Right. So that perspective makes you realize why do I not love myself enough or care enough about myself to be doing these things to me? And then at 60, when I'm sick and I have bigger problems, I just don't want anyone regretting and looking back and going, gosh, I wish I knew this. I wish I'd not thought, you know, when you're young, you just think you're invincible and you're like, oh, I got this. Like mm -hmm. I can have six drinks this week. I, my liver can handle it. And then as we age, well, what happens? Your antioxidants go down. Your mitochondrial function goes down because now you had Epstein-Barr virus. You get COVID. You have all these viruses that destroy your mitochondria. You get more tired. You drink more coffee. You go on meds to stimulate you. But no one asked, like, how do all these things affect your body and how can I help my mitochondria? And we talk a lot about, a lot about mitochondria because, as you know, the sperm and egg are important. So that mitochondria for the sperm is important to get to the egg. But then after that, once they meet, it's all on the females, right? Mm -hmm. That baby gets all its mitochondria from mom. Yes. And this is a huge passion of mine because I found out a couple of years ago that I had Epstein-Barr virus titer so high. And, you know, you've had, you've heard probably someone's had mono and they get really tired yep. or they get that flu-like symptom or they have mm -hmm. fibromyalgia that flares and often I find in my practice these are not fibromyalgia flares these are viral flares or in autoimmune disease we'll see these viral flares where you just get so tired you get sore it feels like the flu but it's not and so those are important to look at before you have a kid or if you don't want to have a kid because it's your health it's your energy right. it's your vitality is the you know what does um tony robbins say it's like how vital and how and how much energy you have that's life so all of these are important to look at before pregnancy and you don't need a fancy test like you said you, you start with the basics sleep foundations and sometimes no we need to add some nutrients that we just cannot get from our food whether the soil is depleted whether now we have a body that is at a deficit so then you supplement that's the only time i'll supplement is i'm like we really need to supplement because we can't get it elsewhere like the and word suggests it is a supplement to exactly. i love yes. that it's called that thank god yeah. yes. it it's not an alternative it's the supplement to already the good work that the foundation that you're building yeah yeah exactly so you know i think basics liver health gallbladder bile coming out i'm a huge liver gallbladder girl and Often I'll use basic things like castor oil packs or fiber, psyllium husk, flax seeds, and get that bile coming out. So you get those toxins out of you so that you don't pass it on through the placenta to the baby. And same with the guys, you gotta be sweating every day. I don't care what you do. I love that you and I love to dance, um, but you gotta sweat, you know, not just sitting there in the sun, but actually sweat. You gotta make sure you're urinating. You gotta make sure the quality of your bile is good. And you can tell that by the color of your stool. You, so many women and men I see, they go in the bathroom in the morning and then they go 15 minutes later and then 15 minutes later. That's constipation. That means you did not get rid of everything you needed to in one, as my kids call it, one big snake. Should right? be the big S, the big S. The big S, S right? so yeah. Well, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about uh, detoxification and liver health. That is one of... The main functions of the liver is to help uh, neutralize uh, toxins, change them into intermediates, and then excrete them through uh, the urine, um, uh, either through the kidneys or the skin or what have you. Um, let's talk a little bit about what um, detoxification looks like, what a healthy bat, like how often, I was just talking to a friend the other day. She was like, hey, I have a question for you. Is it okay that I'm going to the bathroom every four days? And I was like, what? <laughs> Oh yeah, no. but your gastro will tell you up to 10 days is normal. That's that's the definition, you know, and it's right. like, no, you look at babies, you look at their peristaltic, what happens every time they breastfeed, they poop. They poop, they that's right. Poop. Mm -hmm. So when I, I'm actually starting a detox with a, a group of mine tomorrow, and I do this every spring, and it's more of a heavy duty detox, but you want to be detoxing every day. And I can't stand 
when I hear my fellow doctors say, you don't need to detox your liver. You have a liver for that. And I'm like, yeah, a liver, like my grandmother's liver is very different than my liver and the amount of toxins that are in the air now. She didn't have those around back then. She also didn't have all these meds and birth control pill. And so we are overburdening the body with so much that now we actually need to get in there and do what we, what I call an active detox. And then there's passive detox, which are things that we can do day to day, but active means you actually go in there, you give it extra things that it needs like choline and milk thistle and curcumin and all these extra things so that it can go push out the bile and then you gotta bind the toxin. So binders mm -hmm. like activated charcoal, psyllium husk, a whole bunch of other things that I don't wanna get into details, but they basically bind it so that it can come out. You know, I, I see a lot of um, my patients taking chlorella, spirulina, alpha lipoic acid, all these great things. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can actually be moving around mercury. You can be moving your toxins around. And I loved um, Dr. Walter Crinian, who's taught me so much, who recently passed. And he said, you know, it's always better to keep your mercury and your toxins in your nose and in your knees and not move it around in the body, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. chelation even, you know, and, and basically doing in very aggressive detoxing. And so just to back up, what is detoxification? I know a lot of times I used to think it was such a trendy cleanse. You well, know, people like, think it's like a juice cleanse that you do. Juice fast, yeah. you know, I used to do yeah. it like I remember I had to go to a wedding and I had to fit into a dress and lose a couple of pounds. So like I had literally watermelon juice for three days and lost probably so much muscle. <laughs> but it's <laughs> not that. that. That is not how you cleanse. Fasting absolutely helps your body, right? Repair and it, it, you know, we do this in cancer patients. We, we fast them for 30 days with water, medically supervised. But even that, just giving your body a break, right? I know you're big keto intermittent fasting and just taking time for the body to detoxify and go into autophagy. Yes, and repair. Um, and, 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 you repair. know, you talk about gut health. I mean, just giving your digestive system a break allows for the hyperpermeability um, in the gut to also repair itself as well. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things though I do love that I do do with my patients for the liver and the gallbladder is alkalizing the body, which is baking soda or minerals, adding that to their water. Most of us are just so acidic and mm -hmm. bile is the most alkaline substance in your body, right? And your stomach acid is your most acidic. Often we're low or, or deficient in both. Yes. Deficient is probably not the right word. It's called biliary dyskinesia, meaning the bile is not coming out at the right time or not enough is coming out. So you can get constipation or you have those pellety stools or you have biliary diarrhea. So the rabbit patients. poos. If you have rabbit poos, this is what she's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what that's what my patients call them. They're like, I have these little pellets. I'm like, those yeah. they look like little rabbit poos. Yeah. So you have to detox. So I always say there's two things not allowed in my practice. I probably should say three things. One is having not good enough bowel movements as frequently as two twice a day. Second is if you have sore breasts before your cycle. And third is if you've got sleep issues. Like those three are not allowed in my practice. Those are the first things that I want to hear within the first visit. They are addressed and fixed. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you mentioned detoxification and the importance of the liver and breaking down the toxins often we think of coming from the outside. But there's so much what we call endotoxemia, which is the toxins created within the body yes. that need to get broken down. But yes. often this word hormonal balance, what is that? Half of that balancing comes in from it being recycled and broken down and pooped out. Right. And that's done by your liver and in your gut with beta-glucuronidase. So often I see, you know, I, I recommend like eating more citrus if you actually beta glucuronidase that helps it's in the skin the rind so i usually will juice the, a lemon a whole lemon i just barely take off the skin and i leave the rind on or i'm not a huge fan of like orange juice and things like that but citrus and then obviously cruciferous vegetables or taking calcium d glucurate to help break down that estrogen sometimes we need that so if you have breast tenderness before your cycle and your mama told you that's normal i had it too it ain't normal. It's common, not normal. normal. We, we do yeah. not want anything stimulating breast yeah. tissue. You should not know that your period is coming unless you look about the moon and you're like, oh, here we go. It's, it's going to be <laughs> the full moon coming. 
<laughs> right? Usually yeah. with a full moon, I get a little cranky or emotional and I just yeah. go inward and I don't see that as a negative. I'm like, this is where I'm most in touch. It's a very in time. Yes. And so I, I am love that you're saying this. Yes. I suppress throughout the month that I'm just in that yang, go, go, go mode. Mm. Now is a time where I'm, I'm, I have to listen. You know, in Iran, when I went back home when I was 19, my grandmother showed me these places where they're not used anymore, but there were these little like clay buildings that have a specific name. And this is where women used to go to live. They would leave their kids with the village and their men and the, and the uncles and whoever didn't have their period. And all the women would just go in there and it's like the red tent, you know, and they would just be together. And it was a time where a lot of quietness, peace, going inward, talking. It's just incredible, like what they used to do and what we do. Like now I have my women, you know, work, work, work. They're in pain. They just pop an Advil and they just go. We're not really listening to that that inner inner state or inner voice. Anyways, I just went on a tangent, but no, going th back I, no, no, thank you for saying it because that is one of the things that we are, as women in modern society now, we are divorced from our bodies and we oh. think that we have to behave like men. And that's part of the reason why this podcast exists because I wanted to have conversations around what it means to be a woman. And part of that is attuning to the hormonal milieu that you have, the ebbs and flows of your cycle, mm -hmm. and celebrating and understanding what is happening to understand that when you are shedding an organ, <laughs> you know, you are literally shedding at the endometrial lining mm -hmm. once a month. This is it, it is an inward time, as you were saying, it is a death and it is an opportunity for rebirth. Like we are divorced from these cycles and we repress them. We think that they're annoying. So we take the, you know, we take the bandaid, whatever, however that, whatever form that comes in the mitol, the IUD, whatever it is. And, um, and I think that it, it, as a woman, it, it is, it is, it is your superpower to, menstruate and to understand how you do so. And it used to be like in cultures, uh, Iranian culture would be a very good one. Uh, I can speak to my experience with my uh, ex-husband's family. They were Greek. Like the older, the older you were, the more revered you were, you know, and the women who no longer menstruated, they had passed into menopause, had this great wisdom that they could pass down yeah. onto their onto their daughters and nieces and, you know, whoever. Yeah. And I think we've lost some of that as, as women totally. today in modern society. I look at my grandma, she was actually here cooking. I mean, first of all, like that's how most of them show love is through food and nurturance. But mm. one of the things when I look at her and she's like my hero, I see that they don't try to add things to their lives they don't try to add energy or add a supplement or add caffeine or add anything they mm. she's taught me to try to remove the blockages you know that actually are in my way that i've probably put in my way with my self-fulfilling prophecies and false beliefs that i have mm -hmm. but i always remember and I, I try to teach my female patients because nowadays and by the way this is a book that i absolutely love anyone who is dealing with fertility or it's just awakening so fertility i'll put this in the show notes as well it's a chinese medicine chef and oh the wisdom in this book i mean it's so resonated with me but it's 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 about that female energy the type a go 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 i definitely resonated with me you know and me most too. of us are in that state 99 percent of the females i see this is where they're at and mm -hmm. There's a lot of sometimes resistance, you know, when I, when I say things to them, I can tell they get defensive and I get that. I understand that. So it's understanding what has put your wall up, what has made you the way you are, what has made you divorce. And I love that word that you use. What's, what's caused that? And that's what we want. We don't want to just tell them, don't do that because that's not going to work. It's understanding when did that split happen? When was the, what was the trauma? What was the incident that made you not trust yourself, made you not trust in your own healing powers or trust that you got this? And for me, actually, and I'm going to share something kind of embarrassing, but I don't care. I remember I was a teenager and my breast sizes were not the same. Mm. And I remember telling my mom and she's like, well, let's go to the doctor. And 
I went to the doctor and I remember feeling so ashamed and he said, oh, something is wrong. And I immediately that went into my brain as something is wrong with you. You with are not me. feminine enough because yes. breast is like such a feminine organ, right? Yes. yes. What did he do? I wasn't even sexually active. I got put on birth control pill for that reason. And this is my pet peeve. At least if you're trying to stop con you know, conceiving and you go on birth control pill, that's one thing. But for mm -hmm. acne and painful cycles and everything else that has nothing to do with preventing pregnancy. Uneven breasts are not, I'm know, pretty sure that's not in the insert. No. Yeah. But then when yeah. I would come off it, I would have symptoms and he's like, see, it, it helps. So then I would stay on it and mm -hmm. eventually that fixed itself. But it, it, it was never something that I look back and I go, it wasn't empowering. It didn't, it, it may, it, it robbed me of my own power. And of course, as a teenager, I mean, what feminine girl do you know who's like so confident? This is a time where we're trying to, we're comparing ourselves to others and you're That's vulnerable. Why, like, you're vulnerable. Is so yeah. Important. And moms watching this who have teenagers, I really encourage you to instill and, and teach your kids about these because this generation, I mean, it is so hard. Kids are vaping and like they, it's the teenagers I see in practice right now. It's, it's very difficult time. I'm kind of dreading my kids going into high school, mm -hmm. but we need to, we need to, we've lost that. So I love this book because it reminds you of, of that grandmother feeling, you know, of that grandmother wisdom of her, her knowledge that's in all of us, that inner light is in us. We've just not had either the doctor or the friend or the resources, but here you are giving the resources. So thank you for doing this. We're trying to kind of reignite and bring it back and remove the blockages so that you, it's there. You don't mm. need to do anything extra. Often I say like, what is it? Um, addition by subtraction you know yes. you're, you're not yes. trying to add things to do in your life and so yes. when i when i have my patients in week one of my course there's all these tests that i go through like if you're very cold you might have a thyroid issue if you have a lot of constipation hair loss you might have a thyroid issue but we don't just test the thyroid and go oh it's low let's replace it let's give you thyroid hormone i mean i could that could actually make my job a lot easier and a lot faster but then it's like, why? Why do you have a thyroid issue? So I'm like, I love like you and I are why doctors. We're always asking why, why, why? And For the often, annoying three-year-old doctor that doesn't right? stop asking why, why, why? Yes, why? <laughs> and often yeah. it goes back to such simple things, right? Yeah. Your thoughts, your beliefs, yeah. your sleep, your food, your relationship with yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is why I love mindfulness. I love one of the courses I always recommend to my patients is mindfulness, self-compassion. It changed my life, just learning who I am and how to love myself so that I can have better relationships with myself, my partner, my kids, my food, you know, and the world around me. And yeah, so. I just love where this conversation is going because I think um, one of the things that has been a goal and you've been so vulnerable and thank you so much for sharing that. I know going to the doctor and, and <laughs> it's, you know, as a, as a teenager, you are so vulnerable, right? So for that, for that experience to trend, like as a te that, that would be the only way that most teenagers would interpret that would be, there's something wrong with me. And rather than giving you the tools to empower you to figure it out yourself, it was like, well, we're just going to mute this. And I think, for so many women, I mean, the definition of trauma, if I can ever get Gabor Mate on here, you know, he talks about this idea that trauma is not the, the act that happened. It is the disassociation from yourself, right? So we can talk about trauma oh, in a I myriad of ways. It could be sexual trauma. It could be going to the doctor and being told there's something wrong with you. And then there's that disassociation. You're like, well, I'm just going to live in my brain then because yeah. my body's not safe. Yeah. So I think so many women, um, so many women are disconnected from their bodies. And I, I am like, listen, I, I spent years just as, you know, my body was just a means for my cortex to get around. Like it was like, it was just the taxi that would move the brain. Like I was just not in my body. It was a scary place for me because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the skills or the, 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 the tools to, be in my body and to be able to sit with some of the emotions 
uh, and process them and move through them. I didn't, I didn't have those, I didn't have those skills. And, um, so, so thank you for saying that. I just, um, I just want to honor your, uh, honesty and of course your wisdom here. And I think that reclaiming our wisdom as women, uh, is so important because we are just not little men as much as we want to, as much as all the type A's that are listening to this now are like, yes, we are, we can do whatever that you can do, whatever they can. If we're not saying, we're not talking about skill and ability, but I'm talking about your physiology and the yeah. ebbs and flows. We are just not little men with, with more hormones. We just, we just yeah, aren't. I love the cyclicalness, which is why I tell women when you are a little emotional before your period, don't judge that. That's yeah. not fault. There's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. And going back to that false belief that I had that I wasn't good enough there's something wrong with me again right what happens the universe gives you another opportunity with another experience with the same feeling so you can heal that silly thought that you had and so when I had my daughter and I remember my husband at the time he said I lost not only you know the, the daughter that we had hoped for and I was so broken I lost my wife because you looked at her and so one of her eyes was completely white and I had a beautiful home birth and you know we just slept next to each other the whole night we didn't even look at her because it was just so it's such beautiful bonding and in the morning I remember as soon as I looked at her I guess everyone felt it my husband was like you detached you completely as if you were not yourself ever since then mm -hmm. same thought I'm not good enough what did I do wrong I did this, I did something, I made a mistake. I, and so for a whole year, I had this guilt of going back, like, what did I do? You know, and women who have miscarriages have the same feeling. Women who have failed IVFs, it's like, you know, failure and like, oh, my pet peeve is premature ovarian failure, which is so on the rise. I have 35 year olds being told, 30 year olds being told. And I'm like, it's not possible. How and why are your ovaries failing at such an early age, there's something else going on that we're not looking at. So this is like a pandemic. I know there's other pandemics going on, but no, this is the one that matters now. Yeah, yeah. In men and in women, early or thirty year olds having like I had, I had a thirty two year old with ten miscarriages. You know, so it's so just to go into fertility for a second. When yes. and if you know anyone who's had a miscarriage, please, please, please have their progesterone checked. Make sure the second half of their cycle is at least 14 days. If you don't have a long cycle enough, it won't implant and have enough time to stay there. So that's called the luteal phase defect or low progesterone, which often has to do with egg quality because it's the egg that releases that. But also it has to do with stress and how much how your body feels because progesterone, as we know, can go down that pathway. If your body is in survival mode, fight or flight mode, it does not want to have children. So what is it going to do? It's going to make you not want to have sex with your partner. So your libido is going to go down and it's not, it's not going to want to conceive because imagine caveman days and it's like, there's a lion in front of you. The last thing it wants to do is to have another baby to take care of. Right. So progesterone deficiency can cause miscarriages, but clotting issues, you know, MTHFR, there's a lot of clotting tests that can be done so that you don't have to go through that pain again. But if you've had more than three, please, please, please look at autoimmune. There's always an autoimmune component I find that can cause that. Secondly, sperm. Please let's start talking about sperm quality or at least if you're not going to get it tested, don't wait. This is, this is what the conventional medicine is right now. The guideline is you wait a year of having issues, then you go to the urologist and get a sperm analysis. And I yeah, can't that was you. my that was my question for you because I was saying to you before we started like menopause has this like retroactive definition you have to have no period for a year yeah. in order for you to qualify <laughs> for that label and it's sort of the same in yeah. many ways in in fertility you have to have been trying for a year in order to say okay maybe we want to look at you know the sperm quality yeah. motility morphology we want to look at these things so let let's let's talk a little bit about i, I want to talk about yeah. sperm quality and what are some of the things that you see um see i mean the first thing is like guys get the phones away from yeah. so all of that stuff i mean you can yeah. find all that data what should you do heat you know baths and yeah. but to be honest it's not that that really changes because most men are aware of that they're not taking they're not in the sauna every day when they're trying to conceive but i i'll tell you that there's such a cycle 
physiological component for men and there's also physiological things that they had no idea. So I had three guys last week with sperm aglut agglutination, which means the sperm is sticky, mm -hmm. right? And so here we have a female who's been trying for two years. She has had every single test on the planet and thinks it's her fault. There's something wrong with her because she's 35 or she's 34 and a half. Um, this is two women I have in the same story. And I said, well, has anyone looked at the sperm? And they said, yeah, we did the sperm test. And I said, well, let me look. And I look and it's like morphology. So that means that they don't look normal, right? Is low, below even the normal range, which is bad. And there's stickiness, agglutination. So they didn't do a test called anti-sperm antibodies, which often it's sticky because it's inflamed. And you have to ask why, was there a varicocele? Was there structurally, it's like vasectomy, sometimes I get reversed, that can happen. But in this individual, it wasn't that. And because I find so many men have had a baby like 10 years earlier with their previous wife, and now they're in a new relationship. So they think, oh, we're good. Like I've had a baby, so it must be you. And no, things change. Like your health will change in three years, four years, 10 years. So anti-sperm antibodies, anti-ovarian antibodies. This is our own immune system now attacking its own ovaries or adrenals or the sperm. Anti-cardiolipin antibodies or just a basic ANA. So anyone who's had a miscarriage, I highly recommend you get these tests done and get some carrier type genetic testing done. Um, but for men, you know, things like acetyl L-carnitine, zinc, CoQ10, vitamin E, vitamin C, there's research on all of that, especially helping with everything. So I always say that guys have it so easy because they get a new batch every three months roughly. So all they have to do really is like really go at it for three months, eat well, you know, don't drink, don't smoke, do all the stuff that you wouldn't want your kid to do. And then it's, it's so simple. For us, it's a lot more complex because we have everything we're born with. Now we have to make sure we preserve that. Yeah. I actually found really interesting research on rats um, on intermittent fasting. So the rats that they actually fasted had prolonged the quality of the eggs that they had more than the rats that hadn't. We don't have this data on humans yet, but of course it makes sense, right? So we can start doing that in your teens and 20s and 30s because 50% of pregnancies happen unplanned. So like myself, my first, I wasn't ready. I, it, it was an accident, you know, and so that will happen 50% of the time. So don't wait. Don't just think, oh, when I'm ready, when I'm off the pill or when I'm, how many women have I had who've gotten pregnant on the pill, you know, so things can happen. That's why it's important to look at these things, even if you're not testing the sperm or getting advanced testing done on yourself until something is wrong for more than a year. You can still start making the, the changes like cleaning out your laundry detergent and making sure you're not spraying cologne and perfume all over yourself and inhaling all those toxins and burdening your liver, making sure you have a water filter. Bread is not enough. You know, if it's in a plastic, throw it out, like be anti-plastic, like no plastic at all in the house, kind of like an alcoholic is like no alcohol it's not just a little bit is okay just mm -hmm. have that policy and these are all going to be helping your future child because it's about lifestyle changes that you'll pass on to them you know so i'm so happy i'm in this field mainly because of my own health and my kids like the things the the labels they read the the things my son would wasn't touching like the receipts and when he was like three he was like that's toxic you know i knew that word and i was like yes you know it's a naturopathic <laughs> offspring there um but these are, these are things that you can start to do, and it sounds like, oh my God, when you haven't, but it really isn't more expensive. It's not as hard as you think it is, and there's tons of free resources on my website that you can figure out. But for a water filter, I have it under the sink, reverse osmosis, that's in metal. You know, it's not in a plastic. You could add minerals to it. You shouldn't be getting your minerals from water in the first place, but eat more fruits and vegetables and air. Air quality is huge, especially where you're living, your work, your house. Get a good air filter. I, I mean, you would be shocked at the particles and even mercury is in the air. There's toxins in the air. We get most of our toxins actually through breathing it in. And you can't control things when you're outside, but you can control your car or in the house, in the bedroom. 
Yeah, if you think about like the glues that are keeping the carpet down or the paint on the wall or, uh, yeah. you know, even potentially like there's been, we can talk about mold as well. Like you, you had mentioned before you found mold um, when you were renovating your home. Where are some places that someone might look uh, if they're looking for mold, but any, any water damage, obviously any musty smell basements, any place you go and you're like, that doesn't smell good. But honestly, I couldn't always smell things. So I moved into this pretty new house in California and I could not believe all the only symptom I had was just a little bit more tired than usual. Other than that, I had no clue. And I was like, you know, why am I so tired? Like, I don't feel more stressed. I'm not really, nothing has changed. I just had intuitively a feeling, got my air, air tested. I did the ERMI test um, through Dr. Shoemaker, survivingmold.com. So anyone mm -hmm. interested, just go to that website. And the, the score was over 10. And so I literally couldn't see anything anywhere and I couldn't smell anything, but I dug up the kitchen and we should po do a post on this. It was black, the entire, so it had leaked and they had just covered it up. And so fix that my energy is better. Like, so I have a sensitivity, not to some degree that others do. Um, but some females people, are genetically, we're more disposed. We yeah. have genetically more sensitive yep. to mold than men are. One out correct? of four females has that mutation, but yeah. even beyond that mutation, we are more sensitive. And there's a reason for that. Like we are the ones that give life and create we are so the, soil. Course, the universe. Yeah. Would yeah. have made it that way. So we are mm -hmm. more in tune we think more, we analyze more, you know, we're all more overthinkers, men are much more linear, mm. right? So a lot of guys will say, I feel fine. So it's not the mold. And it's like, of course, you feel fine. Like you wouldn't be affected anyways, even if you were, it was right here. Mm -hmm. So, so trust your intuition, trust what you're feeling. If something is off, don't go overboard and get like binders of tests done. Over testing is also not something I advise. And un unfortunately, in the functional medicine world, we see this a lot where mycotoxin and oat test and this test and that test and it's like oh my god we are treating the wrong thing everyone apparently now has SIBO and SIBO is the big thing and it's like no SIBO is the new anti-candida diet that was hot 15 years ago and yeah, then yeah. there'll be something else it's there bacteria is overgrowing there because there's bile issues not enough stomach acid and you know you're on antibiotics or you've had other things that cause that Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to the foundations. Like, is your stomach acidic enough when you're eating? Are you calm when you're eating? If you're not, don't eat. You know, are you breathing? Are your exhales longer than your inhales? Are your sphincters tight? Like, is your anal sphincter like this throughout the day? Are you even in tune with your sphincters? You know, mm -hmm. that's all a sign that the body's like, ah, so it's not going to digest. And everything starts there. Otherwise, you're not going to get your nutrients. But for my men, I'm big on antioxidants, antioxidants in supplement form, and then acai, wild blueberries, Indian gooseberry, really getting them on an anti-inflammatory, high antioxidant rich diet can really, really affect their sperm. That's great. I love this. And then let, let's, let's talk. I have a question about uh, men, and then I want to move into maybe talking about your best recommendations in terms of a diet for fertility. And you've sort of started touching on that with the men. Yeah. Do you find that one of the things I have found when I have tested um, some of my male uh, clients is that their testosterone levels are, I, I don't know what is happening, but almost every man, there's this estrogenization that is happening to our men and their testosterone levels are tanking. Yeah. Do you see that as also a contributing factor to why we're seeing changes in the sperm quality? Yeah, that and energy, fertility. I mean, I have 25 year olds with low T. And so I've been writing about this, that there's like a pandemic that very yeah. young guys even have it. And I do attribute it to our food supply, the, the hormones and the estrogens, mm -hmm. even the birth control pill in the water. And it's in the water. Yeah. And yeah. all the toxins that will back up the liver's mm -hmm. pathway and these get aromatized or beer, you know, hops and barley. And that aromatization happening. So if the guy is drinking beer and they have low tea, that's the first thing to do to stop that. But when I see that, I'll do further testing. That often tells me something else is going on that is making either the DHEA not convert to testosterone. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. very stressed, perhaps. 
but looking at are they drinking milk are they having meat that's not organic are they having foods and then what kind of water are they drinking and then i'll do like a toxic panel and find like high bpa you know a lot of these chemicals that they may have gotten from mom and now the body so it's never like i never say the body all of a sudden decides like okay now i'm just going to lower my t it's like the cup as we know gets full 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 and then we see these water pouring out and that's when the symptoms come on right so mm -hmm. you got to kind of go what has filled that cup up and it often has to do with these basic things that we're talking about toxins diet water mm -hmm. air thoughts stress sleep mm -hmm. but yeah low tea absolutely affects that and so zinc is very important so zinc is often researched and and can be helpful 30 milligrams a day, at least for men, um, to make sure they they can make zinc, uh, make testosterone. So let, let's move into diet because we've been sort of dancing around it a little bit. We've been talking about acai berries and antioxidants. Has, that's really important. Zinc for you know cell proliferation and division. What are if we talk about foods first? Then I'd like to move into. Uh, I also want to talk about female, like if there's specific breakouts for women. Uh, what is I know that there's no, there's not one diet, right, for the human right. species. We're all too, I mean, even you and I, right? Like you and I have the same parts, but we metabolize things different. We have different detoxification and methylation pathways and all these sort of things. But if you can give some general guidelines in terms of what you like to see to improve fertility, and I I think you said this in the pre-chat. I think you also said this in on in our conversation, but fertility is just health. Like how can we be eating for whether or not you want children, being fertile is 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 inherent to we that is how we express our health. Yeah. So let let's talk a little bit about how nutrition can play a role in that and I'd love for you to talk about what you've seen based on the science but if you can also draw on even just some of the ancient wisdom that you have also yeah. uh, accrued with your own uh you know with your yeah. grandmother and and sort of culturally as well I think that might be really helpful. So it's funny if you look at India Chinese medicine and the ayurvedic and all these ancient what you'll see in a lot of them is they're not not anti-meat they're not anti-dairy actually raw milk and raw cheeses with all their fermented whole fat you know the um, nourishing traditions is another great book by the Western Price Foundation where they looked at um, places around the world where women and men live to be a hundred with their own teeth and really good skeletal bones and health and children who are born with good jaw meaning the teeth are not cramped. These were signs of health. And they looked at, they ate organ meats, which I grew up on, such as liver, which is liver. so important for fertility, mm -hmm. for vitamin A and iron and, and all the nutrients. Basically, your liver stores a lot of the vitamins, right? That's what it's doing. Um, but quality is important. So I don't want everyone running out there and, and either you're grossed out by that or you're maybe not going to eat the right things. But they looked at these cultures and they found that None of them were vegan, none of them were vegetarian, but they didn't have processed food. They didn't have sugars and carbs and, you know, all the fast food stuff that we have now available to us, right? So that's one thing, and, and that's more the style that I abide to, not because I was raised that way, but because all the women I've seen in the 13 years of my practice, I haven't seen the healthiest group be my vegans and vegetarians. I myself have gone vegan. I have been vegetarian throughout medical school, mainly because I was a poor student and couldn't afford good quality meat, but I didn't feel good. And so I always say, you look at your constitution. And so when I had to come up with the trimester zero diet, it was so difficult for me because like you said, there's no such thing. There's research and the doctors that are very much for veganism. Uh, the research they're quoting is basically PCOS patients or patients who to me are usually in that study, they were, they were overweight, insulin resistant, very unhealthy. And of course, again, they looked at live birth. They did not look beyond that. They didn't look at anything else. And so they, they'll quote and say the vegan diet is the best diet and low fat, no fat, no saturated fat. So I don't like that. That's not what I've seen help. It's not my belief. It's just I'm looking often at their EPA levels, your omegas, right? Your EPA, your DHA, which is super important for baby's eyes and brain. And 
it's very hard to get that from a vegan diet. Of course, we all know they're going to be B12 deficient, vitamin D, vitamin A, a lot of deficiencies. But to them, they'll say, let's just say they're supplementing all that, which hopefully all of you vegans and vegetarians, you may not like this comment, but you hopefully are supplementing those because you're not going to get that from your diet. But to me, intuitively, if a diet causes deficiencies or your belief around something is actually going to cause so many deficiencies that are needed by the human being, something's wrong there. Something doesn't make sense there. However, I do want to say that there can be some paleo or Mediterranean style or whatever, anyone who just eats meat. You can be so be unhealthy scary. doing the keto diet if all you're having is the keto bars and the keto fat bomb. Like, all day. Yeah. Same. So, yeah. Absolutely. You can yeah. definitely be a very unhealthy vegan and just have vegan chips and rice and crappy food all day. And I do see that. And I have vegan patients with holes in their heart that I'm like, oh my God, they're going to like die of heart disease, but their cholesterol and everything looks good. And then I also have PCOS patients who are so inflamed, who are so in, in like insulin resistance that I might temporarily say, you know what, for three weeks, let's cut out meats, let's cut out this, and then let's really clean up. I just want you to do broths and vegetables and fruits and um, clean protein. But that doesn't mean that they can't eat meat. But for fertility, if you look at every single culture and, and research on the Mediterranean diet being the best anti-inflammatory diet, it includes animal proteins. So that is something I do recommend, mainly because most of the women I see are deficient. They are either anemic, they're either cold, they have low blood pressure, they have stress, they have all symptoms of what we call blood deficiency in Chinese medicine. We call it liver blood deficiency, meaning not that you're just low in iron, but you don't have enough blood. They'll be more on the pale side, their tongue might be pale, um, they tend to be cold, they have cold hands and feet. These are all signs that you literally need blood, you need nutrients, you need warming foods. Warming foods means things that actually raise your core temperature. And you don't need cooling foods. You don't need things that already are cold. They're going to make you cooler, like cucumbers and yogurts and watermelon. And a lot of these foods are cooling. So I look at you individually and say, if you have acne and you're overweight and you're a hot person and you have a lot of abdominal obesity and you are, your CRP is high, you're inflamed, you're going to need much more of an anti-inflammatory diet. And I might cut out some of the inflammatory foods that might include meat for you and coffee and acidic foods and then once you're in a better state we'll see we'll see what your body needs but that person's constitution is very different than someone else like me who is on the cold side i'm more on the blood deficient side my iron has been low on my my blood pressure tends to be on the low side so i need meat in my in my diet that doesn't mean i eat meat three times a day but that means good quality grass-fed you know, meat such as lamb and bone broths. Like my favorite for women often is lamb bone broths. It's mm -hmm. so high in nutrients mm -hmm. and you add turmeric and peppercorn and lots of vegetables in there. And if you really are grossed out or you don't want to eat the meat, eat the broth, eat all the nutrients that come, of, come from it. But in terms of fertility, trimester zero all the way to the fourth trimester, one of the best food is bone broth. It is something that ancient history has given women for milk production the liquid my mouth is watering <laughs> my mom is actually cooking and I can my grand my grandmother would give that to me when i was sick like she was like here's the bone broth. like and she would have the bones and like she would anytime she would make chicken she'd save the carcass anytime there was uh like oh, um uh, meat on the bone, she'd save that. And then we'd have, we used to have the marrow. Like that was like the little, like the chef's treat, right? It was like scooping the marrow out of the bone. So you want to get that calcium from food. I'm not a big proponent of giving calcium as a supplement or even during pregnancy. Same, a same. Lot of, you know, yeah. a lot of women will lose that calcium when they start breastfeeding. So you want to build up everything. And then my other favorite is iodine. Iodine's huge for baby's IQ. And so we want to make sure you're getting seaweed and sea vegetables or even taking an iodine supplement. If you don't sweat ever, you might be low on iodine. If you have breast cysts or ovarian cysts, those can also be linked to iodine deficiency. So that's important. Your omegas, as I said, which a vegetarian vegan diet is not going to give you enough. Even if you are the healthiest 
I mean, you'd have to have a chef 24 seven, in my opinion, if you're on a vegan diet to be able to make really, really good meals. And if you do in your home and you're really doing that and you don't have any symptoms of blood deficiency, and the number one symptom I, I see is sometimes people crave meat. They're like craving a burger. And that's mm -hmm. the body telling you it needs iron in that form, right? Iron heme form versus the spinach form is very different. But what can happen also is a lot of the vegans I see, they have spinach every day, right? They have almond milk every day. They have Swiss chard every day. These foods are so high in histamine that then they start having like joint pain and they're like, I don't understand. Like, why am I having, and I'm like, you're having like, you know, histamine issues. This is, these, these foods you're going to become sensitive to because you're having it every single day. That's why I love sort of more of the Mediterranean and just being able to have a little bit of everything in moderation, right? Anything you want to eat, you should be able to eat and not react. If it's a small amount, even a piece of toast, even a piece of bread. I mean, I, I don't recommend going everything free unless you have to. So my patients who have Hashimoto's or autoimmune disease, yes, heck yes, I'm cutting out gluten and dairy and soy for them. But that could be that that's not the issue. And the tomato, they have a nightshade allergy or sensitivity. Mm -hmm. My philosophy, though, is that I don't do a lot of food sensitivity tests, A, because they're not always accurate, and B, what are you going to do when you find out you have all these sensitivities? Are you just going to remove them and then bring them back in and then do the whole recycling? The issue is your immune system. The issue is your gut. You've got to fix that. That is what's reacting to the food. It's not the poor food's fault that is doing harm. It's and your the stress response that you're going to now develop every time you see yes. the avocado you were told you can never eat again. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? I feel like we do so yeah. much more harm with those yeah. testing and, yeah. you know, I have a lot of health coaches that that's all they do. They just really literally run all these tests on people and put them on these protocols. So I'm very anti-protocol. I'm all about precision medicine and individualizing your diet for you. But for men, I usually say anti-inflammatory, no alcohol. They found one alcohol can affect that sperm within a week. Mm -hmm. One drink. Mm -hmm. weed, smoking, vaping. Oh my God. My, one of my patients said, can you please send me some articles to send to my husband? Because the OBGYN said, you know, he's smoking weed every week. It, it doesn't affect our fertility or the sperm at all. And I was like blown away because I'd seen it, but I guess I hadn't written an article on it. And there was 22 different articles, 2,200 articles on PubMed on marijuana. And I thought, which one do you want me to send? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, How long do you want to read for? Yeah. It's huge. So mm -hmm. for men, I, I say, anti-inflammatory diet, just fruits and vegetables, and get them responsible. Start, Stop being their mother. Stop saying, I have to give him his supplements. He won't take these pills. I have to make him a smoothie. Like I can't tell you how many women tell me that they're not on board, and I'm thinking, this is the future father of your kid. How are you going to be together as a team when actually shit hits the fan and things go bad? Like let's say he wants and to And they will. And they, they will. Are, well, how yeah. are you going to agree? Yeah. He's already not on board. How do we yeah. get them on board to see that 50% of this future child is you? Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's that's the thing I see often is women are making all this new food now, the anti-inflammatory, the smoothies, the shakes. The other thing I do want to mention with fertility and diet is you don't want to have a lot of cold food. So like literally cold, like a lot of raw juices and Oh my God, my pet peeve is celery juice. Celery juice is not good for fertility. It will push out bile, but it will cool your temperature down. It will lower your blood pressure. And for fertility, you want warming foods. You want stews and soups and goji berries and blackberries and half fruits and vegetables, but not a lot of raw food. Like a healthy food, healthy diet, which might be salads and you know broccoli and all of that raw is not the same as a fertility diet. A fertility diet is not raw salads all day and smoothies and green smoothies and green juices all day. That's a lot of raw food. Think of what we give babies. We give babies cooked foods, steamed, puree, easy to digest so they can absorb it. They don't get gassy. They don't get bloated. They don't have diarrhea or constipation. You want the same thing so that you absorb it so that it's you get all the nutrients from it. So of course, if it's summer, you can have a salad here and there, that's not a problem. But especially in the winter when the when it's cold out, 
you'll see what's in season, right? Squash and sweet potatoes and, you know, make more of those in, in terms of steaming it or baking it or cooking it. I love that. And just to circle back to the uh, vegan, I just wanted to make a comment because I, I think that what you're, what I hear you saying is for, if the goal is fertility, you know, you can, in the same way that you will take someone who is inflamed and say, we are going to put a, we're going to have now a therapeutic intervention and we are going to give you more plants. We are going to make your diet more plant-based and more vegan-like for a short period of time. The opposite is also true for vegans and vegetarians, right? We can implement a therapeutic diet that is going to improve their fertility through meat and through eating some of these other foods, like these warming foods that you're talking about that they may not necessarily be getting because all they're having is these cold foods, these green smoothies every day. And it doesn't have to be for the rest of your life, right? Like we're not saying all vegans, you must die. You must put down the torch and no more veganism for you. It's a therapeutic intervention in the same way that I might have a woman who comes to me and says, listen, I, I need to lose weight and I'm a sugar addict. Well, what we need to do is we need to have a therapeutic intervention of being in a ketotic state where we are depleting her cells, glycogen, like her glycogen store, so she can now move into her triglycer her adipose tissue, get the triglycerides, break them down and use them for uh, ener like an energetic substrate. So I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to highlight that because sometimes, um, and I've, I've, I've you know, sometimes I feel like I have to tiptoe a little bit with my vegans because they're so um, passionate about the way that they eat. And I understand it. And I know you do as well. It is, and I agree with 98% of what vegans say in terms of like the way that most like conventional animals are treated, their lives, the way they're killed. It's, it's, it's abhorrent. It's terrible. And, um, you know, to Dr. Mark Hyman's point and to your point around regenerative agriculture and raising our animals humanely and having them roam freely so that they're eating grass and actually going out in nature. Like these are the types of meats that we're asking you to consume for a short duration of time in order for you to achieve the health goal that you have now presented with, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At farmer's markets, a lot of, I mean, when I was in Toronto, we owned like, we had a share in a cow and we would get, you know, milk, fresh milk and I mean, it's different. When I was in Iran, I remember we would all drink milk and we were fine. Like my nails, my skin, my yeah. hair were glowing. I come here, I have milk, I'm instantly in the bathroom. So there is Same. a difference. Same with Same. pasta in Italy. Yeah. I have pizza and pasta, totally fine. Yes. Here, I cannot tolerate it. So mm. it, it quality does matter. And, and for the vegans watching, at least I say, please, at least have eggs. You need the choline. choline Just for the cool. choline. Yeah. Just, this choline is yeah. so important and yeah. eggs are such a great source of i mean unless you're really allergic to it and you can't but just trying to eat a little bit more also diversifying that for the future child's immune system it's good to have that exposure moms that had carrot juice you know every, a glass a day during their pregnancy versus moms who didn't guess what their kids liked when they were babies carrot juice compared to ones who didn't they didn't like having carrots so that taste bud it affects it so that's why i love when moms tell me they eat a whole variety of things because i'm thinking great that child is not going to be as picky or is going to like whatever you're eating because it's it's getting exposure right so if you're very limited mentally also look at control look at you know some of my patients whether they're vegan paleo keto it doesn't matter that constrains the liver's energy, the liver chi. We say the more you're constrained in your thoughts and beliefs and this is it, this is the way, this is what causes stagnation and tightness in the body, right? We want more, when I say we want, who am I to say what we want? But it's, I found that in practice, people who are more at peace and have that balance of just going with the ebbs and flows of, Hmm, I feel like having meat today, or I totally don't feel like having any meat for this week. Let's, you just listen to your body. You go with what intuitive, intuitively it feels right and not abiding by a diet, unless like you said, there's a therapeutic problem. If you've got high triglycerides, if you've got prediabetes, 
whatever is the issue, look at what diet best suits that. So I love the keto diet when some of my patients are pre-diabetic and their insulin's high. I'm like, we got to fix this quickly. And if we have three months, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Or my Hashimoto's patient went AIP seven years not getting pregnant. And she that's all we did for her. And she has a two-year-old now. So diet can be therapeutically very important. But if you're not even thinking fertility, at least just start paying attention. I can't tell you how many people like have milk, you know, and they have symptoms of like acne and all kinds of problems. And I'm like, just cut it out. Just try it for three weeks. That's all I'm asking you to do or four weeks and just see how you feel and, and then reintroduce it back in. So an elimination diet, that's what we call it, can be yes. so much more powerful than a food sensitivity test. Can we touch on the difference? And this is something that I... Uh, I don't, I don't know if I want to call this a pet peeve, but I would bump up a lot with, with uh, patients on the difference between folate or folinic acid and mm -hmm. folic acid. So you, you go to the grocery store or the supermarket and they have these brands that are, you know, things, uh, there's one that I'm thinking of in particular in Canada that I would have mo most patients like, oh yeah, I'm on, I'm on Materna. I'm on this, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at it and it's folic acid. Yeah. Um, can you speak to the, the importance of folate and why folic acid? And we can talk about, let, let, let's start there. Yeah. The difference between so folic, folic, folic and folate. Yes. Yeah. So folate is like the umbrella term for all these different things. So it's kind of like saying car. Well, that's like a folate, but what kind of car? We have lots of different kinds of car. If you need to get a truck or do you need like a sedan? So folate is very, very general. It doesn't actually mean anything. So if your supplement says folate, you need to call the company and say, what kind of folate? Right. right? right. So folate doesn't mean anything. It's, it's an umbrella term. Then we yeah. have folinic acid and then the 5-MTHF and then 5-tetrahydrofolate, all these maybe long words that you can't even pronounce. And then we have folic acid acid, folic, not folinic acid. So it's very confusing. I didn't know all this stuff. I took a ton of folic acid when I was pregnant because back then no one even knew about the MTHFR. It was just starting to come out. So there's a gene, I call it the swear word gene, MTHFR. And mm -hmm. this gene mutation, up to 70% of the population actually has a 50 to 70, depending on which variant. What it does is it helps you detoxify and it helps your body basically. We're all carbon based. We're not like Star Wars where I think it's silica. Basically, every <laughs> transaction, um, I think I got that wrong, but you know what I mean. So, carbon yeah, in the yeah. body, every transaction that a carbon does, if you remember chemistry, where you have a hydrogen next to it and you, you, you move the hydrogens, and that's called methylation. That's a methyl group, is a carbon and three hydrogens. Anything in the body, every system, every organ, this is such an important gene. And a mutation means like, imagine you're going to photocopy this page and you know, this, this side of the page just gets a little crooked and then you photocopy it, but now half the, the page is missing. So that, that's like a SNP, what we say, or a mutation, meaning it, it's not gonna function properly. When you have these mutations, which many of my moms and dads have, and, and, and I wanna reiterate, dads are important for MTHFR as well. It's not just a mom thing then you can't break down this synthetic folate called folic acid, which we used to spray the crops back in the days, um, like in the 50s and 70s, to prevent neural tube defects. And guess what? There's tons of research. It worked. It did reduce neural tube defects. But back then, we did not know about this gene mutation. We didn't know the harm that it could also do. So we went one step forward. Neural tube defects are now really on the low but then we start seeing all these other problems in our kids and children and going wait a second like could this be from that could it not there still isn't enough evidence out there which is why a lot of OBGYNs will say this gene clinically is still not as important but it's the same thing it's we're just not there yet we do know it's very important in heart disease and cardiovascular disease for strokes so anyone in your family history who's had a stroke or a heart attack look at MTHFR. Anyone with clotting, 
anyone who has this gene and goes on the birth control pill, I take them off it. You're at risk for having clotting issues. So it's very important for miscarriages as well. This is a the 1298C, that's one of them. That one actually has been linked more to miscarriage than the C677 and also to anxiety, but they're both important. So I look at which, so you got one bad one or one good one from mom and dad, you have two. And do you wanna look at how, you wanna look at how many you have. Do you have two bad copies, one bad copy? Does your husband have one bad copy, two bad copies? So we look at that and we say, how much folate do you need? And by folate, I mean the natural version that the body uses, not folic acid, folic acid, why is the big deal? Why would you care if you're taking something not natural? Well, the thing is, anytime we put something in the body that it doesn't recognize, it actually causes more stress. It has to break it down. The liver now has to go, what is this birth control, which is synthetic? What is this Adderall, which is synthetic chemical? What is this folic acid? It needs a lot of work to break down something that it does not recognize. And so that can cause oxidative stress. It can cause a lot of problems. So look at, you know, you don't need to be crazy and look at every single ingredient, but a lot of things that are processed like cheeses and breads and crackers and, you know, thing, things in the supermarket, you'll see they're fortified with folic acid. And this was, again, back from a long time ago when we didn't know about this gene. But please, 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 I mean, nowadays, a lot of companies are taking out this ingredient and replacing it with the natural folate for a reason. But some are still so old school and some doctors still don't even know about this and they're still prescribing folic acid to their patients. But please just don't take it, like take the natural version. I mean, it, it, does, it makes complete sense. And you can also get this naturally from greens. So eating a lot of green vegetables, leafy greens, you'll get it but you might need extra. If you have depression, there is a medication called Deplin, which basically is patented folate, that's all it is. And that's what we use in psychiatry to help with mood disorders because methylfolate is very important for mood um, and, and how, how well you feel. But it's very important also for clotting, heart disease and miscarriage. So I, I usually recommend prenatals or even supplements so my daughter takes methylated folate because she has two bad mutations. She got one from me and one from dad. So she can't detoxify as well. So mm -hmm. I have to be more careful with her compared to my son who doesn't have that mutation. If she gets exposed to toxins, her body actually cannot break it down as well as you and I can and he can. So she actually needs to be doing things to help her body detoxify. And that's also important too. If you know you have that mutation and now you've got mercury and all kinds of other toxins in you, you need to do more of an aggressive supportive um, pathway systems to help you detox, but at least just take the natural folate. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. And you, you did, you did a bang up job on that. Thank you. Just in, um, in, I mean, I feel like I could talk to you forever on this. If there was truly, um, if, if there was, if you had like a hope, you know, if there was a hope or a shift mm -hmm. um, for changing the way that we view procreation or bringing children into this world or the way that we view ourselves in terms of our, you know, if there was like a grade of fertility that we could give ourselves, like mm -hmm. how, what would be your hope or dream in terms of the work that you're doing and the way that that mindset, mindset might shift to, okay, I need to have a baby right now. Is, yeah. what, what, what is it that you would love to see? I think a lot has to do with training doctors and my hope before I die or, you know, I don't want my ego to be too attached to this, but I would love for there to be a trimester zero taught in schools and doctors to be educated, nurses to be educated and them to teach couples this because when you go see your PCP, if, the, if that person sees you so often but never raises, hey, I noticed you're on birth control pill, you know, you might want to come off it a bit earlier just in case or hey, I notice you have PCOS or you're pre-diabetic and, you know, just in terms of fertility down the road, you know, putting people in this trimester zero mind frame earlier because it breaks my heart when someone's 42, 43 and they've been trying for so long and it's like, oh, sometimes it's too late, you know, and I wish I had seen them 
earlier. So getting a hold of doctors and nurses and practitioners and educating them on this is my hope. And then hoping that they go into the schools and educate our kids. I mean, my daughter, the things she's taught, the amount of sugar in the school, the nurses, the amount of vaccines are given, the, it all starts with them, these kids and what we teach them. So they're lucky they have me, but a lot of parents, they don't know this. And so whatever the child is taught in school and in health education and sex education and you know, so it's got to be taught in sex education. Someone's got to talk about the birth control pill and the side effects so that oh, teenager yes. knows. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. so I think edu mm -hmm. education is my, my dream is that this gets out more than just me and you and our listeners and that the health authorities are on board. That's beautiful. And I will put uh, in the show notes, I will put um, the trimester zero uh, link to that course. It's I remember I remember us talking about it. Uh, we were at a we were at an event together, and like I'm going to put together this course, and now it's here. So I'm so happy, uh, so happy to be able to share that with um, with my people. And your, I agree with you. Sometimes I have said in private conversations with people like you, and we have lots of mutual friends um, uh, who have very similar beliefs in our in our community. That I feel so blessed to know what I do and yeah. to be able to go into the literature and like read the stuff. Cause not everybody has the inclination. I'm like, not everybody wants that. They just like, give me the quick, give me what I need to know now. So I feel yeah. so blessed to understand how things work in the body and to know that everything like the, you know, kind of just coming back to what we were saying before around being proving, you know, this is proven or this is unproven. Like it's so nuanced and the devil is always in the details. Um, and yeah. so I just want to thank you for breaking down some of the, um, misconceptions that we have around fertility, whether it's that the male, uh, sperm quality, uh, and sperm count and the health of the male is also important. Looking at, at our genetics, looking at detoxification. That's another area. I don't know why, but people get crazy about liver deep. It's like, well, the liver already detoxes. So why do we have to worry about it? And it's like, well, because there's things that we can do to amplify it. <laughs> and there are things that are, you know, irrefutable in terms of like giving them, you were saying, you know, sulforaphanes, like, you know, the brassica family and giving them green leafy vegetables, these things upregulate liver detoxification. So helping people process, yeah. and especially when they have these polymorphisms, um, in their genes, as you've been talking about these yeah. SNPs um, that preclude people from detoxifying um, as efficiently as they can. So I just want to thank you for your time. I know we've been we've been going at this now for like two hours, something like that. Um, and uh, it's just been um, it's thank just you. been a dream thank to be you. able to and see I just wanna, you. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you for having me. I just want to offer all your listeners also, if they're interested, five hundred dollars off because I just want to I want to help and I want to spread this so. Yeah. Thank you for having me today, Dr. Stephanie. You are welcome. And I'll put, if there's a discount code, I'll just, t you can just tell me that yeah. and I'll put that in the show notes as well. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much.